Okay, today I'm going to give an overview of the endocrine system and answer the what questions. What is the difference between nervous and endocrine systems? What is the difference between endocrine and exocrine glands? What are the two major endocrine hormonal mechanisms? What is meant by hormone target cell specificity? And what is negative feedback regulation? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. Okay, so nervous system and endocrine systems do not duplicate each other. They complement each other's functions. So in the left-hand column will be the nervous system and the right-hand column will be the endocrine system. The nervous system communicates cell to cell or neuron to neuron with electrical impulses and then through neurotransmitters where the endocrine system communicates cell to cell through hormones. The nervous system releases neurotransmitters at the synapse, the space between neurons, at specific target cells, either neuron to neuron or neuron to effective tissue. Where the endocrine system releases hormones into the bloodstream for general distribution throughout the body. An endocrine gland secretes hormones all and then goes into the blood and gets distributed throughout the entire body. Therefore, the nervous system acts very local and very specific in its effect. Whereas the endocrine system is very widespread effect. A hormone enters the blood and transports all throughout the body. So the nervous system reacts quickly to a stimulus within milliseconds. So uh, a neuron innervates a muscle, bam, that muscle contracts. Whereas the endocrine system reacts slowly to stimuli seconds, to minutes, to hours, to days, and sometimes weeks. An example is a hormone that helps to build bone or to break down bone. It just doesn't happen in, this, in milliseconds like a muscle contracting. It takes a period of time to break down bone or to build bone. And then the nervous system can stop quickly when the stimulus stops. You innervate a muscle, it contracts, and then you stop the stimulus, the muscle relaxes. Whereas the endocrine system may continue responding after the stimulus ends. When you have the parathyroid gland and the parathyroid hormones circulating in the bloodstream, it's affecting the breakdown of bone tissue. But if you actually stop the secretion of parathyroid hormone, it takes a little bit of time for that effect to be seen to stop happening. So what is the difference between endocrine versus exocrine glands? Well, both endocrine and exocrine glands produce and secrete products in the body. So the endocrine glands, they secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream to be distributed throughout the body. The examples are pancreas to adrenal gland. So here we have in yellow an endocrine gland and in the red is a capillary or the bloodstream. So the endocrine gland produces a hormone in green secretes that hormone into the interstitial space, which is then brought into a capillary and distributed throughout the body. Now, in contrast, an exocrine gland secretes its product into a duct to be distributed onto an epithelial surface. And so examples are sebaceous and sweat glands, liver, pancreas, and goblet cells. So here we have in yellow is an exocrine gland, and each one of those circles represents an exocrine cell. And then there's the duct going up to an epithelial surface. And so in blue, in this case it's sweat or water, that's being produced and sweat secretions go and bathe an epithelial surface. Now, a couple of definitions. Endocrine glands are tissues that produce hormones and secrete those hormones into the bloodstream as shown in this picture. A hormone is a long-distance chemical signal that travels in the blood or the lymph. A receptor is then a molecule that responds to a specific hormone, and the target tissue is a tissue that possesses receptors for which a specific hormone acts. And this term, a ligand, is a molecule that binds another molecule. So a ligand and hormone, in this case, are synonymous. Okay, so now the chemistry of hormones. There are two main classes of hormones in the endocrine system. One are peptide hormones and two are steroid hormones. Let's talk about each. Um, but uh, on the right-hand side in yellow are showing the major endocrine glands in the body. And then in, the, in caveats below and indented are the hormones secreted by each of these, or the major hormones secreted by each of these endocrine glands. So first, peptide hormones. These are synthesized from amino acids and amines, peptides, and proteins is what these hormones are made of. And in pink are all of the hormones that are pepti considered peptide hormones. 
Then steroid hormones, I'm using the color orange, are synthesized from cholesterol, and these are adrenal cortical and gonadal hormones primarily, and you can see those aldosterone, cortisol, androgens, and then the sex steroid hormones, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. So in pink, peptide hormones, they act on the plasma membrane, whereas steroid hormones in orange act inside the cell or intracellularly. So what are the steroid hormones? Aldosterone, cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Those are the major ones. And what are the peptide hormones? Everything else. All the other hormones are peptides. Now, a couple of things before we continue, because there's always the exceptions. Tyrosine-derived amine hormones are divided into the following two classes. Catecholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, they behave like peptides, which means they bind on a protein receptor in the cell membrane and through some second messenger like G proteins cause a cascade of events. Whereas the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, they behave like steroids, which means they act inside the cell intracellularly. So now let's put all that together. On the left are the peptide hormones that act on the cell membrane including norepinephrine and epinephrine. And on the right are the steroid hormones that act inside the cell, which includes T3 and T4. Now, the mechanisms of hormone action, uh, there are two. So we have talked about the peptide hormones, their action, and steroid-based hormones and their mechanism of action. So let's start with peptide hormones. So peptide hormones are water-soluble. And as such, they cannot enter the target cells and go directly through the plasma membrane, so they bind to a protein receptor on the outside. So they bind with membrane receptors in the plasma membrane. So here we have just one little section of a plasma membrane. You can see the phospholipid bilayer. And in blue, we've got a receptor. And so what happens then is the hormone binds to the receptor and activates this G protein cascade. The binding of a peptide hormone to the outside portion, and so you see now it begins this transduction pathway with this G protein second messenger. So binding of a peptide hormone to the outside portion of this G protein coupled receptor, it induces this allosteric conformational change in this intracellular portion of the receptor. So this altered conformation has this increased affinity for this G protein, which then is then changed. So now what happens here is, as my illustration is not perfect by any means, is that this G protein, this second messenger, mediates a target cell response. And so what this means is the G protein is going to be the baton between these two athletic runners. The receptor is one person that ten takes its message, the baton is G protein, and so what happens then is the binding of the G protein to this ligand receptor it causes through a cascade of events this G protein to then bind to, and activate or sometimes inactivate an effector protein. It's often an enzyme or an ion channel. In this case, it's an enzyme, which then activates transcription factors in the nucleus and maybe protein synthesis to begin basically cascade of signal events, CAMP and so forth. Okay, so peptide hormones bind to receptor in the cell membrane through G protein cause something to happen inside the cell. Now, the second is steroid or lipid hormones, and these are water insoluble hormones, which means they can go through the plasma membrane. And so they act intracellularly and directly activate genes. So the hormone passes through the plasma membrane and enters the cell. So here we have in blue is a cell and in yellow is the nucleus. E represents estrogen, which then that estrogen hormone passes through the plasma membrane and enters the cell and then binds to a protein receptor in the nucleus. ER stands for estrogen receptor. That's the protein receptor. And then this now activated estrogen receptor combination with estrogen mediates the target cell response. So directly activates genes, stimulates the synthesis of specific proteins. So it then binds to a nucleus, nuclear receptor for this estrogen complex, which then initiates a cascade of events like activates RNA polymerase, which makes messenger RNA, which then instigates protein, or which is going the sequence of making proteins. Or causes DNA polymerase to activate and then causes cell proliferation. Then the estrogen receptor and the estrogen 
are recycled. So here we have is this mechanism of an action for steroid hormones. Now, hormones target cell specificity. Target cells must have specific receptors to which the hormone binds. So hormones and receptors are like a lock and key. So there we see a lock and a key, and the key fits the lock. But if we have another key that doesn't fit the lock, you can try all day sticking it in the lock, and it's not going to unlock or cause the lock to open. So here we have as a target tissue, and there's a receptor on this target tissue, and here's one hormone and another hormone, okay? Now watch the yellow hormone, like the yellow key, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't activate that receptor. Whereas the purple hormone fits the receptor like a key and thus will activate that tissue. So let's do that again. Here we have a, a, secreting, a, a secreting cell or an endocrine gland that has producing hormones that will then go inside blood vessels. And then we have two different target cells. One target cell that has a receptor that's not specific for that hormone and another target cell that does have a specific receptor. Now let's watch. That endocrine gland secretes its hormone into the bloodstream, which then flows through the blood. And watch as it then diffuses into the interstitial space, but it, that key, that hormone, doesn't fit that lock. Therefore, it just goes off. Nothing happens in that target cell. The receptor isn't specific. Now watch what happens when you put a hormone in the bloodstream that flows and then goes into the interstitial fluid and binds to a specific receptor that's a receptor that's specific to it. Shing! That hormone will now affect that cell to do something. Okay, so here we now have, let's do an example. We have here on top, we have ACTH hormone, and here we have T3 and T4 hormones. So the ACTH receptors are only found on certain cells like the adrenal cortex. And the T3, T4 receptors or thyroxine receptors are found on nearly all body cells. So there is a blood vessel, and here is a bunch of five different cells throughout the body, adrenal cortex cell, enterocyte in the GI tract, adrenal tubule cell in the nephron, goblet cell in the GI tract, and skeletal muscle cell in your biceps. <gasps> I don't know why I tried to do that without breathing, but I did. Okay, so now let's take a look at um, ACTH. ACTH is secreted um, uh, by the pituitary gland. It then enters the blood vessel and goes throughout all the body. And watch what happens as that hormone then diffuses into the tissues when that ACTH hormone tries to bind to the enterocyte and the renal tubule goblet cells and skeletal muscle cells, it's like a key that doesn't fit a lock and does not affect those tissues. But look, shing, there ACTH binds to the adrenal cortex receptor specific for it and activates some type of affection. So therefore, ACTH affects the adrenal cortex in this case, but not really any other cell. Now let's take a look at T3 and T4, secrete that from the thyroid gland as it enters the bloodstream and goes all throughout the body, and then that diffuses into the tissues. Look, all of those cells have receptors, therefore all of those cells will have some type of effect. Therefore T3, T4 affects many, many cells because there are thyroxine receptors on pretty much all body cells. All right. So um, target cell activation depends on three factors. Number one, the blood levels of the hormone. Few hormones, few, uh, a little activation. Lots of hormones, a lot of activation. Now, little and lot, I've exaggerated this concept because really these levels of hormones vary only a little bit because of the negative feedback mechanism. But the concept I want to get is the more hormones are in the blood, the more activation of effector tissues you will get. Second, the relative number of receptors on or in the target cell. You have a couple of receptors, you get a little bit of activation. Lots of receptors, you'll get a lot of activation. And finally, the affinity of binding between the receptor and hormone also has an, a, a factor into the activation of those effector tissues. Okay, so those are the three factors affecting target cell activation in the endocrine system. Okay, hormones circulate in the blood either free or bound. So, I mean, steroids and the thyroid hormones, they're actually attached to plasma protein. So, they're piggybacking on a plasma protein as they go throughout the blood. And then they go into the interstitial space. They separate. And all others, these peptide hormones, they circulate within the bloodstream without any carriers. Now, hormones are removed from the blood 
by a few mechanisms. One, degrading enzymes that are found throughout the body. For an example, um, acetylcholine going throughout the body when it binds to an acetylcholinergic receptor, acetylcholine esterase will break it down immediately, degrade it. Um, kidneys will uh, filter and then excrete hormones. And the liver will also break down hormones. And so we have this idea of a half-life that because of these degrading enzymes and the function of the kidneys and the liver, you have this thing called half-time, which is the time required for a hormone's blood level to decrease by a half. Now, the control of hormone release. Hormone levels are controlled by a negative feedback mechanism, like a thermostat in your house. Set at 70 degrees. If the temperature goes above 70 degrees, say 73, your air conditioner kicks in until the, the host temperature goes back to 70, and then the, thermo, then the AC turns off. So let's see how this works in the endocrine system. A stimulus triggers a hormone secretion. The increase of hormone levels cause a target organ effect, and the target organ effects decrease further hormone secretion. Now let's see if that works. Here in blue is the anterior pituitary gland. There is the thyroid gland, and inside the thyroid gland are specific cells called thyroid follicular cells, and then there's some effector organ like a tissue in the body. Now the anterior pituitary secretes Thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, which flows throughout the bloodstream and targets specifically follicular cells. And the green plus means it stimulates follicle cells to produce T3 and T4 hormones. Hooray! Which enter the bloodstream and T3, T4 go throughout the blood and have a positive effect in regulating metabolic function of these effector cells and these effector organs. But watch. As T3, T4 hormone levels rise in the body, they will inhibit the anterior pituitary gland from producing TSH. If TSH then is not produced, the thyroid gland stops producing T3, T4, which stops affecting those tissues. And then what happens also is that, the, that you'll have decreasing levels of T3, T4, which the negative feedback on the anterior pituitary will stop, which means the anterior pituitary is ready to produce TSH again. This is negative feedback. And this, my friends, is an overview of the endocrine system in a nutshell.